When we think about a religion, a few things might come to mind. Maybe the concept of a god or other supernatural beings, sacred scripture that's often believed to be divine in origin, organized religious authorities and an institutional hierarchy, and a set of rituals and other religious practices, such as prayer and pilgrimages. Confucianism certainly satisfies some of these criteria. As we discussed in the first episode of the series, Confucianism is centered around a system of values that stresses morality, deference to one's elders, humaneness, and a sense of justice. First articulated in the Analects of Confucius, these values eventually spread from China to the rest of East Asia, and are today considered to be the cornerstone of traditional culture. Moreover, Confucian texts feature a wide-ranging system of rituals that includes everything from daily rules of social interaction to religious rituals such as funerals, weddings, and coming-of-age ceremonies. On the other hand, throughout the Analects, Confucius rarely speaks about gods and spirits. Well, a divine being called Heaven, or Tien, is sometimes mentioned in the Analects, but Confucius prefers to praise the virtues of human culture and institutions, rather than discussing heaven. Moreover, while Confucius often venerates the five classics, he does not regard them as sacred scripture that embody a divine truth, but as man-made masterpieces that provide us with guidance and inspiration. While they were often revered and their content was memorized and analyzed for centuries, they did not enjoy the same status as sacred scripture, such as the Bible or the Quran. Finally, while the early Confucians were ritualists, from the Han Dynasty onward, they shift their attention from the realm of ritual to that of scholarship and government service. They studied and wrote commentaries on the classics and ran the bureaucracy of the government. Gradually, Buddhist and Taoist priests took over the performance of private and state rituals, but Confucians never developed an organized clergy or religious hierarchy. Unlike their Buddhist and Taoist counterparts, Confucians did not really do missionary work, nor did they develop any conversion rites. You became a Confucian by becoming a member of government not by joining a monastic order or a community of practitioners. Once the Chinese imperial state was disbanded in the early 20th century, very few people thought of themselves as Confucians. In fact, in a recent World Value survey, only 0.2% of the respondents defined their affiliation as Confucian. Even today, the government of the People's Republic of China does not recognize Confucianism as a religion. It's not one of the five official religions recognized by the government, and Confucian sites are run by the State Administration of Cultural Heritage and not by the State Administration for Religious Affairs, which supervises Buddhist, Taoist, Christian, and Muslim sites. So, if most people don't regard Confucianism as a religious affiliation, not even the Chinese government, why then does Confucianism feature in a bunch of lists of world religions? Why is it included in textbooks and college syllabi? How can a so-called religion with no clergy, no sacred scriptures, and no pantheon of gods or spirits fit in alongside Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism? The answer to that question is rooted in the encounter between East and West. In the 16th century, the Vatican formed a new religious order known as the Society of Jesus. It was designed to expand the reach of the Catholic Church outside of Europe. Its members, the Jesuits, were highly educated missionaries who traveled across the world to convert indigenous populations to Christianity. To do so, they learned the local languages and customs and often produced reports about the cultures they explored. Their writings, especially their scholarly studies of Buddhism and Confucianism, introduced European intellectuals to non-Western philosophies and religions for the first time, and constructed our modern understanding of the tradition that we now call Confucianism. In the 19th century, university scholars picked up the work of the Jesuits, who set up a new academic discipline known as comparative religion, aimed at providing a scientific account of the world's religions. Major religious books were translated into English and were later incorporated into college curricula. This included the five classics and the Analects, cementing Confucianism's status as a major religious tradition. 
Today, if we look at chapters on Confucianism in popular textbooks, and you're looking at one of my favorites right now, it's called Religion Matters, we'll notice some similar features. They begin with the topics that we covered in the first video in this series. The classics, the life of Confucius, and the key terms in his political and social philosophy, such as humaneness, filial piety, and ritual. This is usually followed by a discussion of the more religious elements associated with Confucianism. Ancestor worship, the imperial state religion, and the cult of Confucius. And by cult, I mean the religious veneration of Confucius. In this video, we'll begin by discussing these three components. We'll then turn our attention to the early modern period and see how China's encounter with the West gave birth to the notion of Confucianism as a world religion. Let's start with ancestor worship. While often associated with Confucianism, rituals designed to venerate deceased members of one's lineage have been performed in China for hundreds of years before Confucius. The Shang Dynasty Oracle Bones, which are divinatory records that are the earliest written documents in Chinese history, reveal a highly developed pantheon of gods headed by a single deity, known as Lord on High, or Shang Di. Below him we find the spirits of the dead, who reside in some sort of netherworld, but they retain the ability to observe and influence the world of the living. In order to appease the ancestors, the Shang people offered them sacrifices and asked for their blessings. When the Zhou dynasty eventually took over, they replaced the worship of Lord on High with the cult of their own god, known as Heaven. But ancestor veneration remained central to their religious life. This was the cultural and religious context that Confucius was raised in. And Confucius drew on the popularity of these practices and used them as the inspiration for developing the philosophical concept of filial piety, a feeling of reverence to one's living elders. But he continued to stress the importance of upholding the rituals of worshiping the souls of the dead. The Analects and the Five Classics feature detailed descriptions of funeral rites, rules for proper grieving etiquette, and an array of commemorative rites designed to nourish the spirits in the netherworld. The filial son, according to the records of rites, should not forget the appearance of their deceased parents, nor the sound of their voice. He should retain in his heart their wishes, preferences, and desires. Through his display of love, it would be as if they are still alive. Through his display of ritual reverence, it would be as if they are standing right in front of him. While the early Confucians valued ancestor worship, they never had a monopoly over this practice, nor was it considered to be exclusively Confucian. Textual evidence from the Warring States period and the Han Dynasty suggests that other ritualists, such as spirit mediums, who were definitely not members of the educated group of Confucians, played a central role in ancestral sacrifices on all levels of Chinese society. After the fall of the Han Dynasty, when Buddhism and Taoism began establishing themselves as China's two central organized religious traditions, they developed their own ancestor worship rituals. The most famous of them are the Buddhist Ghost Festival, called Yulan Pen, and its Taoist counterpart, the Zhang Yuan, which got more and more popular during the Tang Dynasty and are still practiced across East Asia today. The popularity of these Buddhist and Taoist rituals among all members of Chinese society led educated elites to develop a version of ancestor worship that was more clearly Confucian. They began decorating their tombs with artwork that featured stories of filial piety, and drew on ancient texts to develop new liturgies that were visibly Confucian, rather than Buddhist or Taoist. For the first time in Chinese history, Confucianism began to be discussed as a coherent and independent religion that existed alongside Buddhism and Taoism. Let's turn now to the imperial state religion. This is a set of rituals, often labeled as Confucian, that began to take shape during the Han Dynasty and continued to flourish for over 2,000 years. The state religion is centered around the emperor, known as the Son of Heaven, or Tianze, and his performance of sacred rituals in the imperial capital. As you might recall, when the Zhou dynasty took over the Shang, they replaced their main deity, Lord on High, with a new being called Heaven. In the Five Classics and the Analects, we find multiple references to the idea that Heaven bestows upon the ruler a special mandate to govern on its behalf. As long as the ruler does their job properly, their dynasty maintains Heaven's blessing. But if they deviate from Heaven's moral guidelines, they can and should be replaced. 
During the Han Dynasty, the Confucian architects of the New Empire began developing an official state religion based on the ancient rituals described in the classics. At the center of this religion was the Son of Heaven, who served as its high priest. His tasks included sacrifices to the ancestors of the imperial lineage, agricultural rituals performed at the altars of grain and soil, and most notably, rituals directed at heaven, staged at the southern regions of the capital. In Beijing, which was the imperial capital on and off from the 12th century, these were conducted in the Temple of Heaven, located a few miles south of the famous Forbidden City. The rituals of the state religion were considered crucial for maintaining harmony between heaven, nature, and the human world. But almost no one outside of the inner court had the opportunity to witness these rites. Most common people probably didn't even know they existed. Moreover, while the original blueprint for the state religion was based on the Confucian classics, later emperors incorporated Taoist and Buddhist ritual. The emperors of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, for example, held Buddhist ceremonies in the capital alongside sacrifices to heaven. The first emperor of the Ming dynasty, who grew up in poverty and really did not like Confucian bureaucracy, introduced the worship of Zhen Wu, the Taoist god of war, as an imperial ritual. More importantly, there was one main figure who did not feature in the state religion. The great sage himself, Confucius. What gives? The cult of Confucius is perhaps the most natural candidate for a religious form of Confucianism. Throughout the Warring States period, Confucius was regarded as an important historical figure. But by the end of the Han Dynasty, we see the emergence of new mythologies that stressed his supernatural qualities. Some even argue that Confucius was born as a result of a sacred union between a human mother and a divine father. According to the myth, while his mother was pregnant, she was visited by a Chilin, a mythical one-horned beast, who told her that her son will become an uncrowned king, a leader who will not hold office but will nonetheless change the world. These legends transformed Confucius from a regular guy into a mythical being, a god. Imperial academies began offering regular sacrifices to him. The first temple of Confucius was built outside his hometown in modern Shandong province in the 5th century, and some emperors traveled all the way there to venerate the great sage. During the Tang Dynasty, Confucius was introduced into the imperial pantheon of gods as the patron deity of learning and government. Temples in his honor were built in every provincial capital or county seat. Twice a year, high officials and members of the local educated elite would gather in the courtyard of the temple, pay their respect to his icon, offer food and wine, burn incense, and chant prayers in his honor. During the Song Dynasty, one of the golden eras of Confucianism in China, there were even calls to promote Confucius up the ranks of the imperial pantheon and make his cult an integral part of the state religion. But during the following Ming Dynasty, Confucius' star began to wane. The title of Supreme Sage King of Exalted Culture, which was given to him by the Tang emperors, was stripped away in favor of a much more humble title, Ancient Teacher. In addition, his fancy statues and temples of Confucius across the empire were removed and replaced by plain inscribed tablets bearing his new title, transforming these buildings into austere-looking places that paled in comparison to the colorful Buddhist and Taoist temples. Ironically, the plainness of the temples of Confucius might have played a key role in Confucianism's eventual designation as a world religion. This was a result of the introduction of a new actor into the East Asian sphere of influence, the Jesuits. Established in 1540 by Ignatius of Loyola, the order soon began to send groups of missionaries across the world. They implemented a new strategy known as accommodation. In order to convert the indigenous populations to Christianity, they first learned about the native language, culture, and religion, and then used this knowledge to make Christianity more palatable to the locals. The Jesuits enjoyed a brief period of success in Japan throughout the 16th century, but were eventually ejected from the country, depicted in Martin Scorsese's 2016 film Silence. Really good movie, you should check it out. This prompted them to turn their attention to China. In 1582, an Italian priest by the name of Matteo Ricci arrived at the Portuguese colony of Macau, located in southern China, and established the Jesuit base of operations. Drawing on their experience in Japan, the Jesuits decided to dress in Buddhist robes in order to draw minimal attention to themselves as foreigners. Now, this decision made some sense. Buddhism was the biggest religious tradition in China at the time. It also shared some superficial similarities with Christianity. 
a monastic order, a concept of heaven and hell, sacred buildings populated with statues. This made it easier for the Jesuits to explain their strange religion using familiar Buddhist terminology, a strategy that worked fairly well in Japan. But they soon realized that in China, despite its popularity with the masses, Buddhism was held in relatively low regard by the Confucian elites who ran the imperial government. In 1595, Ricci and his fellow Jesuits decided to reverse course. They tossed their Buddhist robes and began dressing like Confucian officials, and turned their attention to studying the classics. In his writings, Ricci criticized Buddhism and Taoism as idolatrous sectarian groups, and painted Confucianism as the now almost forgotten monotheistic religion of China, in which heaven was the supreme god. In this version of Confucianism, Confucius was not a divine being worshipped in the temples bearing his name, but a wise philosopher whose moral teachings shaped Chinese culture. While Ricci successfully reconciled the state religion and the cult of Confucius with Christian doctrine, there was one key practice that presented him with a problem. Ancestor worship. By this point, the veneration of one's dead ancestors was common among all members of Chinese society, from the emperor to the lowliest of his subjects. In addition to annual rituals dedicated to the dead, like the ghost festival, the most common form of worship was done in the household shrine, where people placed offerings of food and incense in front of ancestral tablets. Ancestor veneration presented a real challenge for the Jesuits because they were kind of the textbook definition of idolatry, the worship of an idol as though it was a god. Ricci tried to explain away ancestral sacrifices as a secular practice, an expression of filial piety, and not a religious activity, but not everyone agreed. This became known as the Rites Controversy, a theological debate between Catholic missionaries that raged on for more than a hundred years. Finally, in 1704, Pope Clement XI issued a decree labeling ancestor worship as idolatry, ending the dispute for good. The Jesuits were banished from China, and conversion efforts did not resume until the 19th century, but this time headed by Protestant missionaries rather than Catholic missionaries. Interestingly, the Jesuit attempt to present Confucianism as a secular ethical philosophy backfired. Following the Vatican's decree, Confucianism was cemented in the Western popular imagination as a religion. An idolatrous pagan religion, but a religion nonetheless. This process reached its high point in the 19th century with the birth of a new academic discipline, the science of religion, what we now call religious studies. Founded by an Oxford University professor by the name of Friedrich Max Müller, the new discipline aimed to offer an empirical, scientific description of the world's various religious traditions. For this purpose, Müller and Oxford University Press commissioned an ambitious 50-volume series called The Sacred Books of the East. It featured the major texts of Islam, Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Taoism, as well as four volumes dedicated to Confucianism. These included partial translations of four of the five classics, most notably the Records of Rites, which contains descriptions and theoretical essays on Confucian ritual. The man who translated the Chinese volumes was the Scottish Protestant missionary James Legge. Originally stationed in the British colony of Hong Kong, Legge studied classical Chinese, and he wrote several books on the life of Confucius and the religions of China and eventually became the first ever professor of Chinese studies at Oxford. Much like the Jesuits, Legge attempted to reconcile Confucianism with his Christian faith. He translated references to the ancient deity Shangdi, Lord on High, as God, and depicted the state religion with its worship of heaven as a proto-monotheistic tradition that can coexist with Christianity. Legge even visited the Temple of Heaven in Beijing and, according to his companions, recited a Christian prayer at the altar. Legge's view of Confucianism as a religion was not accepted by all of his fellow Protestant missionaries, but at the 1893 World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, Confucianism was officially inducted into the Hall of Fame of World Religions. It was represented by officials from the Qing Dynasty government, and while some accounts suggest that they themselves disagreed whether Confucianism really was a religion, the label stuck. Confucianism was accepted as an official world religion, and subsequent textbooks and college syllabi included it ever since. So, is Confucianism a religion? 
well, we can say with some certainty that there was never a single coherent religious tradition whose members identified themselves as Confucians. The state religion was largely invisible to the common person. While people still visit temples of Confucius in China today, they do so sporadically and mostly during exam season. Finally, while ancestor worship is still one of the main religious practices in East Asia, it's not exclusively Confucian. In Japan and Vietnam, for example, the Ghost Festival is essentially a Buddhist event. So what does this mean? Confucianism, like other systems that are often labeled world religions, most notably Shinto in Japan, does not fully conform to the Western and Christian-centric definition of a religion. It lacks an organized clergy, a set of sacred scripture, and a standardized god or pantheon of gods. Also like Shinto, as recent surveys suggest, Confucians today rarely see themselves as members of a distinct sectarian group. They express their Confucianism by participating in rituals, ancestor worship, visits to the Temple of Confucius, and the recitation and study of the classics. This identity is not exclusive. So-called Confucians might also visit their local Taoist temple, or embark on a pilgrimage to one of the holy Buddhist mountains. This does not mean that Confucianism is not perceived by some of its adherents as a religion. On the contrary, scholars such as Duke University sociologist Anna Sun, who studies contemporary Confucianism, argue that we can use the case of Confucianism to challenge our understanding of what a religion is, and expand its definition to become more inclusive. This is especially important since Confucianism is currently going through a major renaissance in China. After decades of decline and suppression, especially under the leadership of Mao Zedong, Confucianism is becoming relevant once again, which we'll cover in our next episode. If you want to learn more about Confucianism, I've curated a recommended reading list on today's sponsor. Perlego. Perlego is an online academic library. It's home to hundreds of thousands of ebooks from top academic publishers. Perlego lets you access any book for as long as you need it with a student friendly monthly subscription. So, on Perlego, I've curated this reading list about Confucianism that you could access today. And while I was making this list, Perlego's library seriously impressed me. Here we have the latest translation of the Analects, published in 2020. You can read the entire book on your phone, tablet, or computer. I've also included a recent intro to Confucianism, published by the scholar Paul Golden, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. If you'd like to read these books and more, Perlego is offering a two-week free trial for the Religion for Breakfast audience. Just click the link in the description below to get started. Thanks, Perlego.